Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are just going to wait a few more seconds while the rest of our attendees filter in from the waiting room. Okay, so it looks like we're all here. Um, welcome, good morning, my name's Greg, I'm from CERC. Uh, just wanted to take a second this morning to welcome you, first of all, and thank you for joining us at this webinar. And uh, take a second to introduce you to the interface of a Zoom webinar. I'm sure at this point, just about everyone is um, very familiar with sitting through Zoom meetings. I feel like we've all, we've all done a lot of them by now. But just so you're aware, there are a couple of minor differences between a Zoom webinar and a Zoom meeting. Um, the first being that we have three main ways for you to uh, inter interact with the session this morning. The first being the chat box, and we use that uh, just for sharing information, saying hi to each other, and so on. If you have a question that you would like to uh, present directly to Darren, then um, please use the Q&A box. Um, so again, we're illustrating the chat box there. The button that's labeled Q&A on your control panel will uh, open up the Q&A box where you can submit a formal question. And uh, we use that because it keeps track of who asked what questions and when. If you see a question there that you uh, would like to second but not necessarily ask a, a second time, you can hit the thumbs up button for that. Um, and then lastly, uh, there is the raise hand button that should be on your Zoom control bar. Um, when you click that, you will be placed in a queue in the order in which the hands were raised. And when we come to the Q&A section of our presentation, we'll be able to unmute you so you can ask your question directly over your microphone. Um, so with that, uh, let me hand it over to uh, Kim Traverso from CSDE, who will uh, open up our session. Kim? Good morning and welcome to Leading Schools for Critical Consciousness, engaging Black and Latinx youth in analyzing, navigating, and challenging racial injustice. This event is sponsored by the Connecticut School Climate Transformation Grant, and I am your host, Kim Traverso from the Connecticut State Department of Education. Schooling for Critical Consciousness addresses how schools can help Black and Latinx youth resist the negative impacts of racial injustice and challenge the root cause. Darren Graves examines how five urban high schools foster critical consciousness among their students. The webinar presents a portrait of schools as they implement programs and practices and analyzes the impact of these approaches on students and with students. Dr. Darren Graves is an Associate Professor of Education and Social Work at Simmons University and an adjunct professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research lies at the intersection of critical race theory, racial identity development, and teacher education. Dr. Graves has reported on its work in, I'm sorry, Dr. Graves has reported on his work in many publications, including his new book, Schooling for Critical Consciousness, Engaging Black and Latinx Youth in Analyzing, Navigating, and Challenging Racial Injustice. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to Darren. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, very glad uh, to be back uh, with y'all. Um, and, you know, I can't see everybody, but for those of you who I've seen before, good to, good to see you again. And for those who have not met before, um, welcome. And I hope this is going to be a, a useful use of your time. Um, let me apologize in advance for, you know, of course, like the day that I have to give this presentation, um, there's like some sort of construction going on around my house. So I apologize in advance for any uh, background noises uh, or anything like that. Um, so, but I think that's all I got to say, and I think I'm going to launch into my presentation for time's sake, and I'm going to share my screen and share my PowerPoint. 
All right, let me just do this right now. Okay, so I hope y'all can see that. And um, so I'm here to talk about leading schooling for critical consciousness. So this is gonna be a chance um, for me to, to talk a, a little bit about the research that's highlighted in our book, Schooling for Critical Consciousness. Um, and, and then pivot at the end towards talking a little bit about what does that mean to lead uh, schools uh, to do this work. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers. And I'll try and get through this as quickly as it makes sense so that we can have as much time to talk to each other. Um, normally, if we were together, I'd, I'd probably build in more back and forth. But I think technology wise, I think it's just gonna make more sense for me to you know, launch into this and then we'll get a chance to talk at the end. Um, so here we go. So I, I think the impetus for this project is very timely. I mean, it, it's crazy because right now there's so much going on in our society around race and racism and p police brutality and the unarmed, you know, killing of unarmed black men. And, and really, you know, the impetus for our project, and when I say our, I mean m me and my co-principal uh, pr investigator and co-author, uh, Dr. Scott Sider um, at Boston College. But basically back in, I want to say around 2012, um, th th these very issues were at the very forefront of our, you know, public discourse and public attention at the time with that you know, at that, that time, the latest iteration of these types of issues. Um, and, and it was troubling to us as citizens, of course, and as people. Um, and we were also um, parents um, and teacher educators. And so what we were really interested in is as those issues were going on, and again, these issues are very timely these days, right, to what's happening contemporaneously, but um, there was a lot of talk about the talk, right? Like what, and, and by the talk, we meant the ways in which black parents were gonna have to explain and socialize um, their children to a world in which they would be treated unfairly, you know, if not inhumanely, right? Um, and so there was a lot of talk and attention to that. We, that made sense to us, especially both of us as parents, but also also we are both, we're both teacher educators. And we're really interested in like, you know, what are schools doing about any of this work, right? What, how are schools helping students um, make sense of any of this, right? Much less, you know, because in our minds, we were hoping that maybe we'd be raising these children to like, you know, inherit a new society in which, you know, this craziness wouldn't be happening. So, you know, what are schools helping students, how are helping stu how are schools helping students make sense of any of these issues? Um, much less, you know, prepare them to do anything about it, right? That, that, that was our impetus then. Um, and I think, you know, sadly, um, the same questions hold for today, right? And, it's, and, and as a developmental psychologist, I'm very um, concerned and interested in the types of messages that young folks, especially young Black and Latinx folks are getting you know, about who they are, who they can become, you know, their identity. Right, um, and how the world works, and how the, and how you know United States society works, right? And and I'm concerned that they're you know that's that they're receiving very mixed messages, right? And and the messages are sort of contradictory in terms of how race and racism will impact their lives moving forward, right? And so what happens, and especially through schools, right? Now, so so schools, right, are gonna put are are gonna are very much going to push a colorblind meritocracy narrative, as they should in some ways, right? In other words, schools are places that tell us, you know, explicitly or implicitly, um, that it doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter what gender you are, so on and so forth. If you're, you will be rewarded by your effort, okay? And I think that's, you know, a laudable and an ideal of American society that we're trying to enact through schools, okay? And so there, we're, th that message is getting sent to young folks, right? They're also by either what they're seeing on, you know, vicariously through the news, right? Or worse, what they're experiencing personally in life, right? One way or another, whether it's things like, you know, spectacular things like what we're seeing 
in terms of police killings or more sadly mundane and everyday forms of racism, they're receiving messages that it, says it does matter what race I am, right? And that meritocracy is a system that is at best warped, right? That doesn't, that doesn't work equally for everybody, right? Um, and so back then and now we're interested in, you know, how young folks come to make sense of this, right? And, we, and you can see in the statistics I have on the slide that, you know, young folks are, are very, you know, very young folks are, are perceiving issues of stereotypes and racism at very early ages. So let us not be worried that, you know, are they too young to learn about this? Because they already are, right? That many, by the time that, you know, we talked to, for example, African-American adolescents, you know, at least three quarters have, would have experienced some form of um, incident with discrimination or prejudice in the last, th you know, three months. And so there's a lot going on that is sending, you know, very mixed messages and confusing messages um, to young, especially Black and Latinx children, right? So one of the things that, you know, one way to think about this is, is to draw on the work of Teresa Perry, um, who argued that in, in a weird way that, that schools that were segregated, right, you know, you know, before, you know, pre-desegregation, right, schools that were segregated, yes, very woefully under resourced, you know, yes, uh, you know, segregated by law, right, but she argued that those schools actually, in a lot of ways, did an amazing job of creating a culture, so, you know, helping uh, build what we she would call identities of achievement, right, um, amongst their students. And that there's a long tradition of, in, especially in the Black, uh, you, know, you know, education uh, history of creating these identities of achievement and these cultures of achievement in the face of all the, you know, very blatant uh, obstacles that were put in front of Black folks in terms of education or, or writ large, right? Um, and that in those, and what, what they did is they used an identity-centered approach in those schools that basically said, hey, look, like, here's the deal. Like, we're, we're going to keep it real with you. Like, the world out there, they don't think that Black people have intellectual capability. They don't think we can read. They don't think we should read. They don't think we are able to be as smart as, you know, white folks, right? Um, we are going to, in this, you know, yes, highly segregated, under-resourced school, turn that narrative on its head, right, uh, as a way to affirm our freedom, okay? And so um, it, it was, and it was this approach that, that helped people develop identities that were both prepared for the challenges that they were going to be facing, right, but also prepared to leap at opportunities that might pipe up through, pop up through, you know, different pockets of hope in the, in the American dream, right? Um, so developing sense of identities that have what I would call critical, a sense of critical hope, a hope that's rooted in a, a sober analysis of the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead of us, right? Um, and you can see in this quote that, that, that many of these schools were intentionally organized in opposition to the ideology of black intellectual inferiority, right? And so what she actually argues, and this is what, kind of what I was saying earlier, is that when schools became desegregated, that intentional mission to, to help intentionally organize, you know, in opposition to the ideology of black inferiority, intellectual inferiority, that actually went away, right? That project went away as we desegregated schools, right? And now it produces this outcome that I was just saying before, confusion, right? Because they're getting mixed messages. In the, at least in the, in, the, in the segregated school, she argues, right, there was no mixed messaging. There was like clarity about the misperceptions that folks, that, that, that society had about them, right? There was, there was clarity about the obstacles of racism that were gonna be put in front of them. And they operated from that perspective, where she argues now that those ideologies and those systems still are in place in a lot of ways, but we're not orienting students to actually handle those through school. Okay, um, so that speaks to um, a notion of an identity-centered model of thinking about education, especially as we move up into the uh, higher grades, right? But it should be throughout the entire, you know, school K to twelve spectrum, right? And it also speaks to school school having a political nature to it and by political i don't mean partisan i don't mean like democrat republican green independent i mean 
you know, why do we do school? Like, what is the purpose of having school? The notion of schooling having uh, a, a role in positioning folks to be able to meaningfully uh, participate in the larger uh, political economy, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and what happens is, right, and there's a lot of research, right, that shows that when you take this approach, so that, so Perry was outlining an approach that sort of happened throughout the history of Black education, and there's been a lot more recent research that shows that when you take that identity-centered approach, that it's actually focusing and trying to build strong racial identities, right, you actually get the academic and psychosocial outcome that we all as educators are actually interested in getting, right? Um, and so that's a long way of saying there's a lot of research that shows that kids who have strong racial identities do better in school, okay? And it's not just magic, right? It's not just sort of like, it's not, a, it's not this notion of like, oh, because we're attending to their, you know, identity needs that then they feel better about themselves, you know, and therefore they just do better. It's, it's a little more, it's, it's more complicated than that. And this, the slide I have in front of us by Daphne Oysterman basically talks about this cycle in which you have, you know, A, you know, what a strong I racial identity mean? It means having a, an awareness of racism, right? So, so in other words, you know, I know we, we uh, instinct for us, and especially these days, is to like, pretend, is to not talk about racism so as to make it go away. But I think what we're finding is that that's a, you know, counterproductive process in a lot of ways. Um, and that when you we actually give them that awareness of racism, and again, this is not just about like making them feel bad, right? This is about just giving them a sense of what the lay of the land is, right? When they have that awareness of racism, that gives them tools um, to fight it when it happens. If we pretend like it doesn't exist and then it starts happening to them, they, you can start to fall into self-blame or you can start to, to have problematic ways of thinking about why bad things and unfair things are happening to you that don't focus on that, these big systems that are at play, right? So this awareness of racism piece is a key piece. Another piece of the strong racial identity is the notion of connectedness. And connectedness can mean sort of connectedness to a community that's very proximal to you and or a sense of connectedness to a larger, if not historical community. And what this really means is that um, the, 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 the everyday doing of school needs, for, especially for Black and Latinx kids, need to be, can, needs, it needs to be rooted in a sense of community, right? That is especially, that, that is, that has a connection to this notion of awareness of racism in that we're saying that there's a historic, you're saying that we, that these young folks are rooted in a historical community, right? That is ongoing, as we can tell to these days for sure, and that is part of an ongoing struggle right, to make, you know, good on the American dream and the American promise, right, and so we need to help see, see uh, uh, help students see themselves as part of that larger community that, that still is doing this work, right, and then also create communities within school, right, and that, that's a notion of, like, trying to make sure that you're being intentional around creating, um, you know, affinity groups or communities of, uh, you know, of folks, of students of color that are, that are that are organized not around just being students of color, but about being um, excellent students who are students of color, right? So in other words, creating communities. And you know, a lot of the schools that have great outcomes for their students of color are ones in which the students of color can create communities within those schools in which they, those communities of color are, uh, are, su are supporting each other in terms of achieving academic excellence, okay? And so this, so the, so the connecting this, again, is both this larger community saying you are part of this larger struggle, right? And this, and these smaller communities that are within the school or within the, the local communities that are saying, hey, we are supporting each other and doing excellent work, right? When those two come together, you get this notion of achievement as resistance. Because I know a lot of us are thinking, like, if, we, if we're teaching young kids of color about racism, won't they just become resistant? Won't they just be apathetic? Um, and that's a possibility, and I think that happens if you only do the awareness of racism piece. If you don't do the connectedness piece, right, and you're not giving them skills and agency to do something about this, yes, they might become apathetic. But when you put these two pieces together, when you say, hey, schooling isn't just like learning ABCs and one, two, threes for ABCs and one, two, three's sake, but it's learning as part of this ongoing mission that your community 
um, is part of, right, then school has contextual meaning. And then the resistance that you want to do is you want to resist against racism. And the way you're going to do that is by achieving, not by becoming apathetic, not by disengaging, but by achieving, right? And so I don't think any of us as, as educators would mind resistance from our young Black um, and, and Latinx students if they were doing it through the means of trying to show that they um, are doing excellent work. Right. And so that's how this actually happens. It's not just let's teach them about racism and then all of a sudden they're going to do well in school. It's, it, it comes through this cycle. I'm going to try and go a little faster now because I feel like I'm spending too much time. Critical consciousness. Right. So for us, critical consciousness is, a, is this notion of thinking about racial identity and adding this component of action, which we'll talk about in a minute. But why does critical consciousness matter? Because in the same way that we, that we see with um, racial, having strong racial identities, critical consciousness is also associated with all these outcomes that we're interested in as educators, whether it's academic or psychosocial, right? You know, it's associated with this notions of being resilient, right? Of when you being ready, when, when, when racism inevitably pops up, even if it's, you know, from a really passive, you know, not you know, intentional way, like that you're ready to handle it, right? Um, rather than self-blaming, right? So there's so many ways in which having a strong critical consciousness, you can see from all this research um, is important. And you can see from, you know, from that last bullet point from the little, you know, uh, thumb that we have on the right like, hand side that from this, from this research project, the data that I'm about to talk about, we found that having a strong racial, I mean, so, so, excuse me, strong critical consciousness was associated with um, higher GPA. So again, I'm gonna make this, I just wanna make this point really clear that this, that what we're about to embark upon, what I'm about to talk about is not a diversion from this notion of getting our students to achieve um, in schools, whatever that means to you. This is a route to that, right? So I don't want us to think of this as a side project to what we're all really trying to achieve. This, what I'm trying to show you with this slide and with the research, and we can talk more about this, is there's so much research that shows that this is how we actually get our students of color in particular to do to to produce the outcomes that we want as educators. So, what is critical consciousness? So, this is a picture of of, of Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire is a Brazilian was a Brazilian educational philosopher. Worked in Brazil, especially with um, rural, poor uh, Brazilian folks, and engaged on you know engage, educational projects that were really geared towards helping these communities transform their own conditions, right? So talk about schooling being like a, a political project, right? This notion of schools as a, as a way to empower, you know, disempowered communities and, and you know, for, for themselves, right? And so this notion of critical consciousness was developed by Freire, which, you know, is coming from that, his famous book, um, which I'm sure many of us know, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, he defines, critical consciousness as, you know, the ability to recognize oppressive forces shaping society and then take action against them. And so in this particular definition, we see two particular components to this, right? The recognition piece, recognize the forces, right? And then take action against them, right? That's the other piece. And that, 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 that's where it starts to get political. Again, not political, not partisan political, but political uh, in nature. And in some ways, right, that's not too far away from how we think about school in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. We're trying to, um, from a political perspective, right, um, you know, have, a, have a, a, a edu an educated electorate, right? And, it's, and we want an educated electorate, so that's to shape the society moving forward, right? And so it's not too dissimilar. Um, and so there is a notion, even in our, our, no, our common notions of education, of like education is not just to learn things, but it's to eventually put that into action, whether it's, um, you know, in the workforce or in terms of shaping our democracy, right? We built on, um, Scott, Scott Sider and I uh, built on that framework, uh, that definition by Freire, and built on the one that, that was uh, 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 put forth by Watts, Deemer, and Voigt. Uh, another conception of critical consciousness that has three parts, right? We see the social analysis piece, right? Which, which coincides with that recognition piece. We see the social action piece, which, which coincides with that action piece. Then it has this third piece, political agency. And political agency is basically just the feeling 
that you can do, that you can make change, right? So it's one thing to be able to analyze. It's another thing to be able to do the actual action. And there's, there's, a, there's a part in between that we feel is important that's about like, can I, do I feel like I can make change, right? So we can imagine folks who feel like they understand what the problem is. And then if we ask them what they can do about it, they don't, they might not feel like they can, right? So that, that we're, when we're thinking about critical consciousness moving forward, we're thinking about this three-part piece of analysis, agency, and action, okay? Um, social analysis, like I said real quick here, is just to, is to the, the ability to name and analyze these political, social, and economic forces, right? Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna, I'll come back. I was gonna talk about the examples of, of each thing that I have here under the, each of these uh, definitions, because they're actually data from our, our studies in the schools, but I'm, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fly through it and, and show us some more detailed uh, examples in a minute. So social analysis is like uh, the ability to name and like, you know, and analyze these forces. Political agency is a belief that one has the capacity to affect change, okay? Um, that's what I was just talking about. And oh, I'm sorry, I, I must have missed the slide. There's a third slide that should have said action, right? That's about the, the various um, activities of doing, um, of actually enacting the change um, in the community. So we, like I said, we were interested in how, me and Scott were interested in how schools help students develop critical consciousness. So what I'm gonna have to talk about is how we did that real quick, how we went about doing that. And then I'm gonna launch into what we found, right? Our study was really about uh, what, um, what role schools and educators can play in fostering youth critical consciousness. What we did is we found five high schools. We found schools that had missions that were really about developing critical consciousness and developing civic engagement because we wanted to find schools for whom like they were doing this work intentionally, right? To see um, how, if at all, it was working, right? And we also realized that there was going to be a, a variety of approaches that schools could take um, in trying to do this critical consciousness development work. So we wanted to find, uh, rather than trying to find the way that this should look, we wanted to look at a variety of potentially successful ways this work could look, right? And what we did is we, and this is the most exciting part about it to me, is we basically, we did a longitudinal study. We, we basically followed the class in 2017 from their first day of school to their last. And we collected two types of data, um, quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative data was really to figure out in these schools, were students' critical consciousness uh, going up over time? And what we did is we actually, um, if you can think about those different components, analysis, agency, action, we actually had different uh, measures that measured those different components of critical consciousness to see if there was uh, whatever looking change over time. And I'll just cut to the chase that yes, over time there was a lot, there was positive change in folks, in, in the students' critical consciousness over time. Then um, a set, the other types of data was qualitative, which is where we lived in the schools. We did lots and lots of days of full days, uh, full, observa full day observations in the schools. Um, and then waves of interviews, four waves of interviews with subsets of students um, to get a sense of what, you know, we, all, we wanted to get a sense of what it would sound like to have critical consciousness as a student, right? And then get a sense of um, how that might change over time, how might, that, how might that, yeah, how might their voices and their explanations change over time. Um, and then also, but more importantly, to get a sense of how, if at all, the school, from the students' perspective, the schools were contributing. Um, to uh, their critical consciousness development. So, uh, oh, this is, this is, I'm sorry, this slide came out of uh, place, but this is the social action side that I was talking about before. But let's launch in. I'm gonna talk, we're gonna talk about, um, for the sake of time, two schools that focus, and each of these schools you'll see will have focused on a spe specific um, component of uh, critical consciousness. And I think for the sake of time, and uh, we'll, fo we'll focus on the social analysis and the political engagement um, components. If you have questions about social action, I have some more slides. If we have time, I can like show you a little bit about that, but I just wanna focus on those two pieces for now. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Make the Road Academy. These are um, pseudonyms. These were all schools in the Northeast, um, all predominantly black and Latinx student populations. Um, and so this is Make the Road Academy. It used a problem posing um, pedagogy, which is really rooted in 
um, sort of a Paolo, like a very Paolo Freudian uh, pedagogical approach, right? Where you're, you're trying to figure out what are the issues in the community that need solving and then organize school around helping folks uh, solve those uh, uh, problems, right? Um, and this is actually, they actually had a, a mural of Paolo Freire like in the school. So that, that's how much they, they uh, like this uh, work. Um, and what we're gonna see is that this school did a particularly good job with the analysis piece of critical consciousness. Um, like I said, we had collected quali you know, qual uh, quantitative data and what we can find is that Make the Road Academy, MTRA, you can see that every year they showed, the students showed growth in their, aware their awareness of sy systemic racism, was, which was our way of measuring the analysis piece. And then you can see that compared to our five featured schools, it's, it, was, it was the highest, its students showed the highest levels of uh, awareness of systemic racism. So basically compared to all the schools that we um, studied in our project, um, this school, Make the Road Academy, their students were, seemed to do the best in terms of their, their measures of uh, social analysis. Um, so what does that sound like, okay? Um, I seem to move something around on my screen real quick so I can read this, sorry. Um, so this is a student, uh, I believe his name is Michael, and this is um, him talking about his analysis of like how racism manifests itself uh, in society. So he says, like in our city, it's a lot of chicken shacks everywhere. You know, you can find a chicken shack here, but if you go out to like the suburbs or something like that, you're not going to find one nowhere, nowhere around. Like you might find a Whole Foods or a farmer's market or something like that. The options of, options of everything is just much different. And it, and it just seemed like certain things are put there for a reason, right? So here's Michael really, uh, doing an analysis of like the food options you know in his community or in communities in general starting to analyze the ways in which um you know so, you know food racism might be institutionalized right um in in communities and so that's 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 a sense of like what it sounds like when students are be, are, are are engaging in that analysis piece of critical consciousness yeah now how do they do this so that you know Make the Road Academy started off by introducing a framework really early on. What they did is they had a social engagement class that all their ninth graders took, right? All their ninth graders took. And what happened was that in that social engagement class, you can see these, this sort of Venn diagram over here, they got introduced to what, this, what was called like the three eyes framework. And the three eyes were basically just different, um, way, different uh, forms of, of racism or oppression that exist. They can be internalized, interpersonal, institutional, right? And so they learned this model, this framework in that class. And what happened is that from that class, um, both, in, you know, this is in their ninth grade, across their ninth grade class, other classes, right? These, this three eyes framework was being used, you know, in their English and in their science and other places, right? Because they knew they were getting it in this social engagement class. And it even continued beyond into their 10th, 11th and 12th grade as different courses you know, in grades ahead of that also employed this um, model, this three eyes model. Um, and so they were, they were given and they were introduced to a framework early on and then the, 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 the teachers utilize those models throughout the breadth of their uh, educational experience, their schooling experience. And so here, in that same, this is the end of that same quote. He's, and this is Michael saying freshman year when we was in uh, the in social engagement class, it made me think about stuff differently. And once I started thinking about it, you start putting the pieces together and you start noticing like nothing happens just because. Like it's all for some reason, like somebody's benefiting from everything and somebody's not benefiting from everything. It's just set up that way for a certain reason, right? So here he is linking back his understanding of how, that, of how racism operates to that actual class, right? And so that, that's what we were really interested in hearing. And we were really interested in getting it, the students' perspectives on this because it's one thing to have a social engagement in class, right? And it's another thing to, for the students to say, yes, that social engagement class had an impact on me, right? And so we were really leaning on how the students were making sense of what they were getting from, from school as opposed to leaning on what the teachers said they were giving them, right? Because we want to get a sense of how students were making sense of any of this, if that makes sense. 
So I want to talk about a, a different school. Um, this is this, this school is called a Spirit Two High School, right? And, and it, it was um, its mission was for students to engage in learning and reflection about their own experiences and relationships in our community, right? And so it took on a different pedagogical approach that was more of a of an an action uh, civics oriented approach, um, and um, the, these students, as we're gonna, as I'm gonna show you here, actually did better in the on the agency piece, right? So, I, so um, these were students, as you can see, over the four years that aspired to their measure of, of political agency grew grew uh, steadily over those. And you can see, and by the way, there's five bars over those four years because we actually took the first bar represents like basically like not exactly day one of school, but like week one or two of school. And then the end of their freshman year, the end of their sophomore, end of junior, end of senior. Okay. And so this school, you can see growth over the, the five time periods in terms of, you know, the political agency and compared to the other schools, um, their students ended up in a higher place um, in terms of agency that compared to the other schools in our project. So how does that happen, right? So political agency is the belief that one has the capacity to affect social or political change. So what happened is in this particular school, they um, gave the students um, opportunities to, and I, and I think in this case, it was an opportunity to look at the, at the school policies, you know, codes of conduct, et cetera, and make a reasonable, um, a revision or change to that policy based on what they thought made sense or was what equitable, right? And so here's a chance, right, to give students some some sort of governance, right, uh, opportunities, right? And basically, um, the students decided that they were going to change the electronic device policy. So this is back to actually, this is you know now about probably six, seven years, maybe five, six years ago, and so. It, we're really at the cusp of like, you know, cell phones being everywhere and schools, you know, you know, having like, you know, reasonable concerns about that and trying to figure out, you know, ways to make that work. And so the, the, the students wanted to make, you know, revisions to the electronic device policy. And so they, they, the students were given that space to do that. Okay. Um, and so basically, you know, the, in this 11th grade civics class, they, 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 the, the students made a presentation to the faculty that basically, you know, stated that the, the, you know, the policy was outdated and that they wanted to be able to create this pass system so that they can um, be ready and be more effect, you know, ready for college, ready for the world, that kind of a thing, right? And so was it just like, okay, you know, you make a decision, you know, you're making a revision and the, and the faculty just says yes? No, right? It was a process, right? They, the the faculty, you know, you know, thanked them for their presentation and then had questions back, right? Like, you know, you know, it, it, you know, uh, you know, reasonable, sound questions, right? And an important part about this is that this is not just about saying let's let students organize and then they succeed, right? You know, failure in some ways is like the best, as we know, in so many different ways, is like the best teacher, right? And so it wasn't they were just like, oh, you want something changed? Great. No, they were like adults and 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 you know educators in the process they were scaffolding this process well wait well we have a question about this right you know um we have a question about that like are you you know is your are you just you know are you presenting you know somewhat biased data or arguments here and so come back to us with some answers to those questions and then we'll see what we can do right and so basically after you know the, a back and forth between the faculty then the uh, a, a reasonable revision led by the students to this policy was changed. And what we're going to see is like, you know, for Janelle, who was an 11th grader in this process that I, you know, she says, I never really thought that schools like listen to students, right? But a spirit really listens to its students being able to make change here. It really does impact my future because I believe, right? Like I can make a change within a small group. That, that's, that's political agency. I believe like I can, if I can make a change within a small group, I can make a change over a big group throughout a long period of time. That is just like, we couldn't have asked for a better quotation to describe what political agency sounds like. And this is really important, this notion of political agency, right? Because political agency is about like, you know, we'd, we'd ask some students, right? Like at a student, at, at a school like Make the Road Academy, I'm just keeping track of time here. At, at a school like Make the Road Academy, 
or where they did a really good job with analysis, right? We go to students at that, we go to that 12th grade student and say, okay, hey, you've been doing like four years, right, of learning about, you know, how these systems work. Like, what do you think, you, what, what can you do to make a change for this, right? And some of these students would say, like, I don't know. Like, either they'd be like, I don't know, like, in general, like, I don't know what it is I should be doing. Or worse, um, I, I know what's to be done, but I don't know if I can do that, right? Maybe later, maybe, maybe when I'm older, right? And that's hard, especially in the face of what a lot of what these students were learning about were youth-led movements, right? The examples of folks their age, like, making changes. And for them to then walk away from it feeling like they weren't, they didn't know if they were able to make any changes felt it could feel discouraging right and so this notion of that feeling that i can do something is crucial especially if we're about the mission of trying to get them to move you know either you know either in the school or out of the school to help make reasonable and positive changes moving forward and so what i think is really important about this example is, is both the fact that we can hear the that that agency piece right um and that it took place within the realms of school. And this is, we'll come to this in a minute, but it's important, right? Because if we're really about schooling for critical consciousness, right? As, as they start to analyze the way things that are going on in the world, right? They're gonna eventually see the ways, and this is not a knock against any school or school leader, because this is just how racism works. Like racism is sort of pernicious and it's sort of everywhere. They're gonna eventually see the way that things like racism and other isms might be happening within our schools and it's not, a way of saying that that means that there, someone there's someone with evil intentions you know doing something in there going on it's more just like you know it requires just some more attention that's all right but what, what it really speaks to is that student school is going to be a reasonable place all right and maybe an important place right for a student for for them to begin to practice the disp the, the 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 analytical and behavioral dispositions of 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 critical consciousness, of analyzing systems of oppression and then trying to act against them, okay? All right? So that has some real, you know, that, that, that poses some real questions and dilemmas for us as educators moving forward, okay? So there's a few different, way, there's a few different ways to think about this. I'm gonna talk about um, the first one. One is that, so, I, and then, by the way, I could show you another set of example. I could show you another example around schools that help students actually as part of the educational process, right? Um, get, you know, do action projects out in their communities as well. I can talk about that a little bit, but I, I just decided not to present on that now because I felt like these first two were like definitely more in the range of what is probably possible for many of us, but I can talk about that as well. But a few things, right? I want us to think about what is the problem with outsized growth in one of these domains and not the others, right? So like I was showing you in, some, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways, what we found is schools that were doing some of the work really well, but not the rest of it, right? So we really wanted to create sort of like a Frankenstein school of all the schools that we were doing the research in and put them together, right? Because we felt like some schools were doing good work on some domains, but not others, right? And so the notion of having school, like students, for example, who have outsized growth in analysis, but not in agency or action, is an example of the, of, of the one that I gave before, where this, we asked the student, now, okay, you've learned a lot about this, but like, well, now what are you going to do about it, right? And, and the person feeling like they don't even, they don't know what to do about it or don't know what they can do about it, right? Or if they can do anything about it, right? That's a problem. I mean, there's no point in learning about, I mean, if we're only going to learn about these things and not give students any sense of agency over it, yes, then we're going to produce that outcome that we're all scared of, that they're going to learn about racism and then become disengaged or apathetic. If we're not giving them agency, right? Um, that is a problem, then that information is just held there for what reason, I'm not sure, okay? Um, if, on, and on the other hand, if we have, and we can see, and we've seen some of the dangerousness, dangerousness of this in, the, in our contemporaneous situations, which is the opposite end of it, which is action without analysis, right? So people just out here, I don't know, engaging whatever action means without even really even knowing why they're out there, what they're doing it for, what it is they're trying to dismantle, right? That's dangerous, right? And you do get some students who like, in some of the action or in the schools where action was the main um, outcome that happened and that students felt you know that they could do some of the students just felt like i did action because i was told to do action all right or because my friends were doing it right not with a particular sense of what it is you know the, the complex system that is that they're trying to dismantle okay and so i think 
overall, we'd want students to be able to have to, to, to do well in all three of those things, right? And so that's what it, so, and I can understand as educators, we might feel like, okay, we want, we want to start to dive into one of these things um, first, because it just sort of fits with our, our school culture, our mission. But eventually, I think you want it to, to, to bleed into the, the different, uh, the three different uh, components of um, critical consciousness. Um, I'm making sure I'm good for time here. Okay. Um, there's real dilemmas, by the way, around how teachers and administrators, uh, you know, prepare themselves when students begin practicing particularly social action. So here's the other, so here's another thing. If we're, if we're about the business of helping students develop critical consciousness, right, that's gonna mean students, again, like I said before, seeing things within our own schools that might be, you know, that are problematic, right? And again, doesn't mean that we're, that, that means that's something about our own personality, their own intentions, it's just about the way that, you know, these systems work, right? And it may be result in students wanting to do something about it, right? And so what that really means is that we need to like be in a position um, as adults, as educators, where we have what I would call pos uh, personal authority, which I wanna put in contradiction to positional authority. Positional authority is do what I say because I'm the adult, I'm the teacher, right? P personal authority is do what I say because I care about you and I know about you and I want the best for you, right? And, in a, and in, a, in a personal authority model, you can have more of a reciprocal learner-teacher relationship with your students, right? And so what that means is like, we have to find a, a middle ground between when students want to start, you know, enacting some of these behaviors and dispositions, we, we want to, we, we're trying to not, we're trying to make this, we're trying to scaffold a teachable moment for them, right? So this notion of getting involved in action or even the analysis, like, all the examples that I talked about in the presentation that you'll find in the book are not extracurricular activities, right? These are part of the classes, right? And so th this is not, even these action pieces are not divorced from school, right? And doing school. And so we have to find a way in which we can, yes, keep students safe. Yes, make sure that this is part of our learning goals as, as a teacher and as a course, right? Um, while also honoring their development in this regard, while also honoring the political nature of the, the, the political nature of schooling, right? And by that, I mean like if they, you know, if, if when we see students engaging in action in this way, this is what we. I mean, for me, that's like a dream as a teacher. Like students who are actively engaged, like members of their school communities, like wanting to like be involved in the governance, like make change, like what, like. If that is not an outcome we're looking for as teachers, the educators, like, I don't know what we're doing schooling for, right? And so it means that we have to think about our roles and our, and our positions as adults and educators and, and, and think about ways to, yes, be adults and be educators who are there to scaffold and, and protect and create, you know, equitable learning environments for our students, while also honoring um, the, 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 the political aspect of this mission, right? And then also just thinking about, again, like what conditions need to be in place for really to help students achieve growth and efficacy in all three of these domains. So let me just say a few things about what leaders need to be doing about this, and then I'm gonna shut, and then I'll be quiet and we can, I can get some back and forth. So the implications for leaders, like, so what we saw in these schools, right? And we remember, again, we remember we were looking for schools that were doing this work on purpose um and and intentionally so that we could see if it was working right so these are just uh um characteristics we saw of the school leaders in these schools right that 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 leaders need to make the work of critical conscious development a stated and primary goal right so in these schools right where the where these leaders the, the principals whoever right were you know they this was this, this was not you know when we came to the classrooms as observers or interviewers the teachers no one was surprised that we were there to learn to, to learn about critical consciousness, right? They, they, you know, because that that's what that they knew that that's this is part of the fabric of the school, part of the fabric of the teaching process, because it was message from from the leader to every to as part of you know the entire culture, right? And so, the, the faculty and staff, you know, saw this as you know a priority coming from leadership. They they knew that it was important from the leadership, right? And I think it's important, and as these leaders, I think, got buy-in with the teachers 
um, by framing the work, again, like I was saying early on, not as a diversion from the quote unquote primary responsibilities or primary outcomes we're looking for from students, but as a means to get to those things, okay? And so in that way, it didn't feel like you were layering something else on top of everything I'm supposed to do. You were just um, asking me to do what I need to do in a, in a way that will produce, you know, hopefully the positive outcomes we're interested in, okay? So that was one big piece of this, right? Another piece in terms of leadership was this intentional, intentionally and continuously seeking to elevate the voices and perspectives of those who've been traditionally silenced. So what does that mean? So like, if you think, think of the example of um, the, the, the 11th grade civics class in the spirit to where they got a chance to like make a change in the school policy, right? How often do we give students, right? Much less students of color, right? Chances to um, make school policy, right? And so, what, what that speaks to is a, a practice, and that's just one example, but I, what, I'm, what I'm really speaking to is proactively creating spaces that invite, you know, the, the, the perspectives of minoritized students, um, families, faculty, staff, you know, to the table, right? Uh, away, proactively creating these spaces, okay? Which speaks to the next thing, like not waiting for the crisis. Oftentimes these conversations happen when someone is right, you know, is, is aggrieved and then it calls for this crisis moment where we all have to come together and think about how we're gonna talk about race and racism. You will head off those crises, right? By constantly being in communication with folks, right? To figure out how people are making sense of the, of, of the places that they're in and then working from there as opposed to waiting for it all to crumble, right? And then having to work from the crisis moment, right? And this work about proactively creating these spaces needs to be ongoing. It needs to be institutionalized. It needs to be a, a, a permanent fixture in the in the doing of school um so as to um create these so th and, that, and that helps create a culture in which then students and you know community members right can are then partners in the educational process which speaks to that, that thing i was saying before about what kind of relationship do the teachers and the students have with each other right um you need to set tangible you know goals and and continuously assess right so like these leaders in these schools right you know had the you know answers to questions like how do we know when we're successful on the school level right like how will we know when this work is working right and and by the way i want to say this again right it, it, you know a lot of it was tied to like actual standards being met right not like other kind of uh, you know goals that were you know tangential to the goals that people are being held accountable for right so that that you know it was tied to that in particular right Thinking about, but and thinking about what kind of data needs to be collected. Some of it's going to be quantitative data, right? Looking at actual, you know, surveys or measures, right? That 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 are quantitative, and some of it's going to be qualitative. Some of this is going to be about trying to understand how students are experiencing the spaces, these spaces, how students are understanding, you know, the ways in which schools are are speaking to their the context that they're navigating inside and outside the walls of schools, right? And then, you know, the, the, the leaders in these schools would have teams of folks looking at different types of data, right? You know, teams of folks, right? People who are different stakeholders coming together to look at this data, whether it's quantitative or qualitatively at, 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 you know, at somewhat regular intervals, right? And some of this even related to, you know, data collected about students who then even left, right, the school and trying to figure out what's going on after the school. But that's, that's, that's for another day. And then the last thing is, you know, for leaders is that, the, you know, leaders in these schools have to provide the support and accountability for doing this work, right? And so, you know, faculty and staff at these schools felt like, you know, this was, you know, doing this type of work, right, was going to be a part of how they were, how they were assessed as, you know, teachers or workers at the school, right? And, you know, the, the leaders didn't just expect it to happen magically, they, they secured resources and time. And I want to say the time piece, right? You know, support this work, but the time piece is really important because I know that there's always like, oh, we need there's so I, I get believe me, I get it. There's a lot of time you need for professional development to talk about this, that, and the next thing. But there's a lot of ways in which this type of work often gets pushed off to the side because in this we've got to do differentiated instruction or this we've got to do our new literacy program, right? This is not again a diversion away from that. This is a way of thinking about how to do those things. So securing time, right, to support this work in targeted ways. And the last thing I'll say is leading by example, right? So 
you as the leader, what work are you doing? Are you participating in any of these professional developments, right? And if so, more importantly, how is, how is that being, how is that evident, right? Like what, what has been, what in the way that you're operating as a leader is now changing as a result of your um, intentionality around thinking about these issues, okay? Um, last thing I'll say is like, so if you're really interested in this work um, and, and more details about this, we have our book, Schooling for Critical Consciousness. I, 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 it's, we made it for educators, we made it for leaders too. We wanted to make it very readable. We wanted to, and, and we had all these different um, types of school pedagogies because we assumed that there wasn't gonna be one way to do this. And we wanted to make sure that they, that a variety of educators coming from a variety of school cultures would feel like they had a way of doing this work. And so you'll see lots of different, you know, examples of the way the work looked um, and hearing student voices around the way they made sense of that work. Um, so, we, so I encourage you to look there um, if you wanna hear more about this. Um, and this is just my contact information. I'll put it in the chat in a second, so you don't have to. I don't have to leave up the um, the slide, but um, I'm just gonna stop here uh, and open it up uh, for questions. I think I'm gonna stop sharing now, if that's okay. All right, thanks. Okay, Darren. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q and A panel. Um, and uh, we do have one participant with her hand up. Uh, so Mary Paul Monks, I am going to uh, unmute you now. Um, and you can uh, ask your question. Oh, the hand went down and I think I unmuted the wrong person. So let's, uh, let us change that. Uh, Nicholas Perone, um, you are up next. And you should be able to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, Darren, thank you so much. This was uh, very timely uh, for some of the things that we're working on in my school. And I, I appreciate uh, all of the things that you have just talked about and, uh, and also inspiring us to uh, create more of a civics-minded uh, approach. Um, so to sort of set the the frame for what I'm looking for. Um, I'm a principal of a K-8 school in New Haven, and we want to build a civic action approach within the school, um, but I'm hoping that you could share or, or sort of point us in the direction of a successful framework uh, with the K-8 model in mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, I, thank you so much for your question, and I have, I have a special place in my heart for, for New Haven, so I love, um, for a variety of reasons, that my brother's still living there, but. Um, Feel free um, to come by for a visit anytime. Oh, I would love to, <laughs> and, and the food, the New Haven food, yes. man, I miss the food. But, um, so to be fair, I, our project focused on high schools, and I think we're actually moving, we're, get, we're getting a lot more questions about what this work could or should look like um, with the elementary, uh, especially elementary ages, and so um, more to come in that regard. But I think to answer your question, I think what we saw for the way this looks successfully um, in school, and I think you could apply this especially to your middle schoolers in particular, right? And maybe even, you know, some of your late, um, you know, your late sort of, you know, your fourth and fifth graders um, is a, a sort of, uh, you know, we saw like one school use the capstone approach, right? Which is basically that as they got, and this, this was high school, but you can think about this in ways that make sense for your grades, right? As they got to their 12th grade, a graduation requirement for these students is they took they, they took a social engagement class which gave them like you know the learning background to be you know sort of civically engaged and then their capstone project was to um, produce um, what they called the change the world project which was a project that they had to bring whether it was just in the form of a public service announcement or something more you know extravagant than that outside the walls of their school into the communities to help you know spread awareness or you know get um uh advocate for something different um that was part and, and and which they then had to come back to their teachers and then like give a formal presentation about um as a way as, as a capstone project for their graduation and so um i guess that's a long-winded way of saying um that 
the action oriented projects that we saw in, in, in our, in our, in our uh, research were ones that were very much scaffolded by the adults, right? It wasn't just like go out there and do something, right? It was very much ones in which the adults were giving them the analytical skills and some of the skills they and some of the other dispositional and behavior skills they would need to engage in an effective uh, in a community engagement campaign. Um, and they were there and, and, and um, they were there to make sure, and it was part of, you know, curricular work, if that makes sense. Um, and the, the interesting thing about those, those schools is that, that if that became like a part of the culture of the school, right, even if it was like only the 12th graders were doing these change the world projects, like the 11th, 10th and 9th graders were all, you know, somehow tangentially, you know, involved in some of these projects, active in some of these projects, it just became a culture of the school so that a ninth grader would go through three years of 12th graders giving their, doing their um, change the world projects before they even did their own, right? So it was a very powerful model. Um, and, and the teachers were always there to make it a teachable moment and to keep them safe um, as well. So I hope that makes sense. It, it does, thank you. That's a great idea. Okay, next up we have um, Charles Elbert going to uh, unmute you now, Charles. Charles, you can unmute your mic. I did. Oh, there we go. We can hear you now. Thank you. Hello, Darren. It's good to see you. Uh, as a pastor, substitute teacher, community activist, born in 1955, is 2020, and I look at, I'm very interested in this race and ethnic relations concept. What do you think, Dan, do, do we have to modify our social studies program? Because when I listen to you and I say, I hear a lot of people or teachers, educators, when they talk about pedagogy and they say, well, we don't want to give them too much too soon. Our children in our urban communities, they, 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 they're receiving so much too soon. They're more smarter than what we think they are. And I think that the social studies uh, curriculum needs to be changed because what I see is I see children, they have no historical background or perspective of who they really are. And see, I got my master's degree in 2018. I had to wait till I got out as a Vietnam vet, came home, had to go to college to find out that I was poor. Because it's only at the college setting when mm -hmm. they tell you that, oh, they, they got these income brackets. And, and, yeah. and that's where I'm, I picked up uh, in my social work classes, Race and Ethnic Relations uh, by Martin Marger. I, I'm reading that right now. And so, so I'm looking and I'm listening to my kids. And we, we have schools with a diverse background of children from Pakistan, from Ethiopia, from Mexico, from, you know, and, and we're still teaching them one form of history. And we, yeah, yeah, let me, can I speak to that? Yeah, I appreciate, I hear what you're saying. Is it okay if I speak to that? Go ahead, Darren, yes. Yeah, yeah. So let me say, I, I wanna say two things. Like, yes, I think what, with history in particular, I'm gonna say something about history and then I'm gonna speak about schooling, okay? With history in particular, what we do um, in, our, in, in K to 12 education, which is very strange, um, is that we teach basically a history and it's usually a political yeah. history, right? And so, um, and then what happens is like you said, as soon as you go to college, like as soon as you go to anything resembling a higher ed history class, the first thing you learn is that there's no a history, there's histories and it's all, it, it basically blows up everything that you learned in, in your K to 12 history education, right? And so, yes, I do think the way we teach history needs to be more like the way we do it in college where we teach histories and, and that and that it doesn't take some exceptional teacher who you know goes out of their way and, and sort of breaks the mold from the traditional you know social studies curriculum for you to your eyes to be open to the fact that there are multiple histories so that's for sure I think to your question about how we train teachers I think we need to train teachers excuse me to see um, the you know the and I think this is across the board, whether it's black students or whatever, right? I'm talking about like the further we, when you do early childhood education, 
your whole the whole it's thing about being a good teacher <laughs> is this notion of like attending to their identity development, right? The further we move away from early childhood education, the more we define good teaching as like this ability to deliver content, right? And what I'm saying is that, by the way, especially as adolescents for sure, but all throughout this K to 12 experience, like these students are like getting, like at your point, Charles, they're getting bombarded with messages, whether it's on purpose or not, about who they are, or who they aren't, or who they can be or who they cannot be, right? And so we need to be way more explicit um, as teachers in general around attending to the identity development, and yes, the racial identity development, particularly of our Black and Latinx students. And so what that means is that, and, and that doesn't just have implications for social studies. That has implications for all the teachers, all the, the, the yes. right? Yes. Math yes. teachers need to yes. figure this out. Sci math and science teachers need to figure that out in particular, right? As we don't, as we don't, as we see not nearly enough, you know, especially Black and Latinx, Latinx students, you know, moving into those fields, right? And so we need teachers who are going to help to help these students see themselves as already being scientists and already, and to your point, Charles, coming from a, a history of scientists and mathematicians, right? And so it's really about, yes, you know, exposing our students to more histories and more authentic histories. And it's also about helping our teachers realize that whether they like it or not, part of their job is identity development. And the way that usually plays out when you're not intentional about it is as follows, like your class is going and then you, and then forty percent of your time looks something like this. Hey, excuse me, guys, I need you to pay. Hey, excuse me, y'all, I need y'all to you know, quiet down. Hey, excuse, right? You're doing that. Everyone, all te we all do this as teachers. We know this. We there, there's so much time lost doing that thing, and that's because the thing that we're actually interrupting is them trying to figure out who they are, right? We make them go to school. School is bombarding with messages about their identity, right? And so we need to be more intentional about that rather than trying to drown that out. And, and learn the Pythagorean theorem. We need to learn the Pythagorean theorem as a means for them to understand who they are. Great, great. Uh, and one last thing, how do, um, uh, um, how do we bring this concept of social consciousness down to the parent level so that they can understand that we, we live in this global society and, and the world is not like it was. In the 20th century, it was not, it's not like it was when they were in school, but we, we're a global community now. How do we get into the urban areas as, as clergy? How do I express this concern to other clergy and other, other people in the community? To listen, this is a conversation we need to be having because I, for me, my opinion is I believe when a child begins to learn who they are, in fourth grade to eighth grade, they make better decisions. If, and as an educator, as, as I'm there, as a substitute teacher in the New Haven Public School System, I run into children that don't even have hope because they can't see who they are. Yeah. So I would, so I would say um, the answer to that. So one, I think you already have a leg up, right? Because I think if it was like some random person from the schools trying to go tell the community, like, or ask the community, like, what, you know. What we should be doing, or what, or, or how things should be changing, right? It would be hard. But you have, you're, you know, you're a part of the community. You're a trusted member of the community. So, the fact that that's the case already is going to give you an advantage and say, hey, like they're going to listen to you and trust you and say, look, like schools need to look different, right? So I yeah. think that's that's the first step. I think too, like, I, it's a very important question. I think we're in the middle of trying to figure out, like, you know, what schools actually need to look like in the 21st century. So I think we're in the midst. Of figuring this out as we are starting to like you know you know as we're in the midst of like all the turmoil that's coming from moving from a manufacturing based economy to this more information based economy so i think there's still an open debate and question about what schools need to look like but third i think it, it's we i don't think um we need to be telling this community what schools need to look like and some and so we need to be partnering with communities to right. figure out what schools need to look like um, and that too often we we don't consider what the community is actually looking for from as an outcome from schools, and usually we just tell them what they should be looking for. So I think we just need to partner with the community. Good. Thank you, Darren. You're my pleasure. Okay, we have next Olga Augusto. Olga, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I, I am an ESL teacher, 
at Anna Grace Academy of the Arts as part of CREC. And um, CREC mission and vision is very explicit, I would say, one of the most explicit ones in terms of demanding equity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm part of my school equity team and I came across and I just wanted to uh, show and maybe I'll put the link into the chat box for people who are hosting this to share, but there is the University of Nebraska Lincoln mm -hmm. um, applied for a grant for a five year grant and this year is the last year of that grant. And on this book, I don't know if you can see it, but it's called the Racial Healing Handbook. I do not know if you have come across this. It was published last year. And, um, okay, awesome. So uh, I, am, I am part of this summer um, online book club discussion on this book. And, what I like about this is the way it's pushing the adults that work with children to really dig deep inside and to do an analysis, a self-analysis, you know, of who do you think you are? You know, what is your, what is your earliest memory of your identity? Uh, what was your first encounter with racism? And it, it addresses um, white people and addresses African-American people and addresses people in between, right? So um, I'm just saying, I'm recommending this. Um, this is a good study even for school principals to go through because one of the things that I'm doing is participating in the summer um, online book club because every year on my school, we present books to be discussed in, in, the, um, in the staff. And we have read several books, um, but I think this one is really, really good in terms of what are we going to do about this? Yeah. You know, so um, anyway, I just wanna say thank you. I appreciate your presentation and um, I look forward to uh, getting your book and reading it as well. <laughs> thank, thank you. So let me say a few, thank you, but I appreciate that. And, and, and I think that Racial Healing Handbook is, a, is an excellent resource. I feel happy to, to plug it as well. Um, so let me just say a few things based on that. I think one is that, yes, like this, the work that to, to do this work well, and you know, any kind of racial, any work around race or racism or, or thinking about oppression, it, it's going to require a lot of self-reflection, right? And so, um, it, no matter what, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you think you are in this process, like it's going to require you to do some real, you know, stepping back and thinking about who you are in this process. Now, what I want to say is this, is that I think some people feel like, okay, I have to do all that work before I d then decide to dive into the work, right, with my students. And I would say that's kind of unrealistic. Um, in the sense that the work that we're talking about, this con this reflective work, is like constant. I don't think there's no end point to that work. There's no point at which, like, it's not like I've now it's because I'm giving this presentation. Like, I have no more work to do in thinking about like who I am in relation to the folks I'm doing work with. Like, I I always have to do this. So that it, it, it's not there's no end zone to that work. So don't feel like you have to get to a certain threshold before you can do that work. Okay. And to my white educators, especially those of us who are thinking about how to do this for students of color, I'm just going to tell you this, like, just be authentic about where you are in this process. Young folks love authenticity. They hate fakeness, right? And so what they will hate is like you pretending that you are where you are, that you, where you are where you aren't, right? And trying to have a conversation and it becomes abundantly clear that you're, you know, not ready to have that conversation in that way. Um, and what they will appreciate is you've, you, being saying look like i i am I'm, I'm putting myself in a vulnerable place right now because i have a lot of work to do right in this regard and i want to i want i want to engage in this conversation some of that's going to be me you know facilitating some of this sometimes i'm going to be learning from y'all like you know but either way right like and then and then and being a facilitator of this work and that with that and and, and being upfront with yourself and with your students they love that 
when the when the teacher was like, I have things, when the educator's like, I have something to learn, right? You know, you know, modeling lifelong learning, right? Um, then, you know, I tell you, the student of color will love the white teacher who is authentically, maybe not the person who knows the most about black things or that or the other, but are at least authentic in who they are and have a, and have a sense of personal authority with their students and that the students will, it will become a community learning project as opposed, right? And it'll be, and it'll be beautiful. Um, the other thing I'll say, building on what, what, what Olga said as well, is that it, a nice practice, especially for you as leaders to, to, to do, is to organize, um, you, know, uh, you know, sort of uh, team learning, whether it's in the form of a book club or, or other types of like teacher inquiry groups around the work that you're doing um, so that the work isn't done in isolation and that you're figuring out, you know, how to do this work best as teams. And then it becomes this part of your professional work as opposed to this sidebar thing where you get to talk, listen to you know, Dr. Darren talk for an hour and then you know, go back to whatever it is you're doing, right? So to create some professional learning communities um, around the work um, is, is another great practice as well. So thank you for that. Okay, um, thank you. We, uh, uh, just a reminder to folks that if you'd like a chance to ask your question live, use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. We're currently clear of raised hands, so maybe we can move on to the question and answer panel. Um, so uh, Dr. Graves, there are three questions sitting open there. Um, I don't know if you can read the first yeah, one. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, Oh, I see. So it seems like the first question from Kim is about like, and maybe I'm, I'm trying to read it quickly, but yes, yes. I, the, I've, we get this question a lot. So this question is, is this, is this stuff around critical consciousness only useful for students of color or, or black and Latinx students or what, right? Or, or how do white folks fit into this? So the answer to the question is this um, approach is good for everybody. Um, both academically and in terms of producing the social outcomes and the political outcomes we might be interested in. So in other words, white folks, yes, have work to do in terms of, you know, like, or, or whatever, whatever it is, whichever, you know, system of oppression it is you're looking at, whether it's race or, you know, sex, gender, or, you know, sexuality or religion or class, whatever it is, like, it's going to take the work of those who are privileged so it's going to take, a, you know, and by the way, the analysis piece for the folks who are privileged is like a big deal, right? I mean, it's a big deal for everybody, right? But it's a huge deal for the folks with privilege because it's when you, it's, it's those of us who have privilege in, in, in various forms that, that, it, that the privilege becomes that, that much more invisible to us, right? Um, and so, the, so the, the notion is that, yes, white folks in this case, right, are going to have to learn how privilege works, right? Learn how racism works, right? And then think about, more importantly, there's a lot of talk about this, this these days, you know, what do I, now that I realize that I have privilege or unearned privilege, like what do I do about it or what can I do about it, right? Um, so I think this work um, applies um, to all students. I, I do hear the, the, the ways in which the, 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 the uh, projects can become more and less complicated depending on the homogeneity right of the of the of the classroom or the school right so if the school's like all white or predominantly white or if it's all black and latinx like it, it seems like a, a relatively straightforward kind of um project in terms of the messaging that's gonna you know and and, and you know and and, and, the, and the framing and the context when it's a home when it's a heterogeneous community it makes it more complicated but in some ways, it, it, it becomes, you know, the ideal testing ground for what it is we're actually trying to accomplish. So in other words, it, it, the framing of it requires us to say, hey, look, like we, we have a necessary but not sufficient set of, uh, of uh, circumstances to, you know, to achieve, uh, you, know, you know, notions of equity. The, ne the necessary part that we have is we have a relatively diverse, you know, community. Right, but does having a diverse community equal equity? We know, 
right? You know, we've seen that in South Africa, we see the United States and in a lot of other places, right? So the, the mere notion that we are all here in the same place does not mean that the work is nearly done, right? Now we have work to do to figure out how to like do this work and do it well. And so it will require um, ways in which you might have to do things like affinity groups, right? So you might have wait times in which you have folks split up into affinity groups doing work and then coming and then coming back together as you know uh, homogeneous uh, heterogeneous groups to work together to think about this stuff but it creates a really fascinating set of circumstances um that will they, that that they will have to you know by the way that for any folks of color who then take this work on in whether into the work world or college will have to navigate that space anyway like how do i what does this work look like right when when i'm you know in you know predominantly white space um right like so I, it just presents an, a set of opportunities to do this work um, strategically, but ultimately together as a community. So I hope that, I hope that, that answers that question. I see Chris's question, right? Well, I think I just answered Chris's question, right? I think in a diverse school, including Black, Latinx, white, right, recent immigrants, yes, I think you, you can think of it in a lot of different ways, I think, we, we have this framework of analyze agency action, I think works, uh, is, is useful despite the demographics, right? You know, and it doesn't, it's not, it's not just about race, right? There could be other, you know, types of oppression, whether it's immigration, whether it's language proficiency, whether it's sexuality, um, uh, 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 able, you know, you know, ableism, different, you know, right? There's different ways you can go at this using that same, Framework. So we think the framework, you know, the analyze, you know, agency action thing works across those different uh, demographics or contexts. But then, yes, it will take on a, the work takes on a different sort of flavor depending on, you know, which issues that you're tackling or which issues are of most significance to your community, whether that's immigration or otherwise. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Right, and I see Mackenzie. I think I said that right. Um, right now, we have trainings for teachers every year that are required every year. Does uh, oh, okay, that's a, that's a question for C E C S D E. But the notion of training, I think all I'll say to this is I can't answer for C S D E, but I will just say that yes, we need, like I was saying before, this work needs to be ongoing. It needs not be like a once a year thing. It needs to be something that gets visited like semi regularly. You know, I know we have very limited time as teachers and there's a lot of things that are asked of us, whether we like to do it or not in terms of how we use our time. But I think it's pretty clear that um, either from personal experience or from what we learned in the research that when you have this once a, once a year model of doing things, it, it, it's not very effective because you kind of do the, you know, the PD everyone goes wow yes racism is the worst or we need to do better with, right? and then you just walk away and then that's the last time you hear about it until the next year right and so um it does i think we this does require for it to be effective to be you know revisited semi-regularly um um whether as a school whether as a um a district um or even the state um julianne um best practices of, oh, for facilitating this learning, yes, in a very wide range of awareness of racism, right? Yeah, no, right, I, I like this question, right? Um, and so some of this is gonna be like, so part of this, again, like, unless you have a class where you can just formulate your class around, you know, let's study what racism is, like a lot of this is gonna be about you connecting, excuse me, these issues, um, to the content that it is you're actually, you know, being required to teach disciplinarily or otherwise, right? And so some of this is just gonna be, yes, around differentiating instruction writ large, but yeah, I think in terms of the, um, the wide range of, especially the analysis piece, like, you know, a range of awareness of racism, um, I think you would, you know, you would approach it similarly to the way you would differentiate instruction in general. I think you wouldn't, it does get boring or we, you know, and this, this is the thing that I deal with when I teach, you know, about racism at the college level, right? Because like you said, like for some of us, we go to college and all of a sudden this is like a, the first time we get to learn about this. 
for other folks, especially folks of color, it's not the first time they had to think about this. And then I'm left in this middle, this ground where I'm having to like reach students at all parts of the thing. And so I think it, it requires intentionality about knowing that, right? One, rather than, because it can be very disheartening, boring, not affirming if we're treating this whole process like it's discovery and there's you know, a sizable amount of the folks in the classroom for whom this is not discovery, right? Um, and so um, I just think it, th what I end up doing is A, naming that dynamic from the very beginning and saying, look, this is a dynamic I'm gonna have to deal with. So people on you know, both sides of those extremes, like bear with me, because it's not gonna be totally ideal for either of you in some ways. Um, and then moving from there to really try and, um, uh, and, and I think for me, what I end up doing is rather than just talking about how racism feels, right? And, you know, that it's wrong, right? We do a lot of studying about how it actually works. We do a, a very scholarly um, approach to thinking about like what racism is. And what that usually ends up evolving is people learn, like, even if it's folks of color or white folks who feel really comfortable in understanding how racism works, usually the content ends up being historical, like, to Charles's earlier point, historical content that we had never been exposed to before or learning about the world in ways, you know, the ways that we haven't had before. So what usually, the ideal thing that happens in those situations is that when you, the, the folks along those spectrum, the folks who, for whom this is very new, right, they get that sort of light bulb, oh my gosh, moment about learning, which is great. And then for the folks for whom this is not necessarily new stuff, right, in terms of about being the awareness of racism, they get a light bulb moment around learning, the, you know, learning the language for something that they, they didn't have language for before or learning it through an example and a particularly relevant historical or contemporaneous example that they hadn't thought about before. And so usually it, 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 when things work out well, you get that type of experience. Um, and I hope that was, and then in terms of the action piece, by the way, like the action piece, like, I, I, you know, some of the action pieces I could have shown you were, were kids who were like literally doing demonstrations in front of like a police station. But some of those actions could be like a public service announcement for your school, right? And everything in between. And so, yes, you can definitely differentiate, you know, what action means or looks like in your school context. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to look at Anna's question real quick. Will schooling for consciousness, uh, will, will schooling for consciousness provide next steps? Um, next steps. Yeah, I think what the, what the book, it's, if, if we're asking about what the book is doing, yes, the book is going to give you a variety of, of, uh, of examples of how this work could and should look. Um, and not just from like a theoretical perspective, but I think we spent like something like 335 days in all these different schools, like all day. And so we wanted to get a lot of detail of, you know, how you, you know, of, you know, we're not, are we going to give you like a week by week lesson plan? No, but we can give you, get, give you some good ideas about units that you could or should be doing, right? And ways, in different ways, the action um, or agency piece can look. And so I think it will give educators and the leaders really um, strong ideas about how to move forward. And my guess is that there'll be certain types of um, examples from the book that'll feel like, yes, this is in our, this is the right, right here um, in our wheelhouse. We can do this. This is a good place to start. And then hopefully give you some goals for, you know, things that are more um, uh, aspirational moving forward in terms of some of the other pieces, whether that's the action piece or otherwise. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers the question. I'm putting my contact information in the chat. I think we're, I don't know, are we, how much, how are we doing for time? Are we out of time or? Is we, are, we are running right at 12 o'clock right oh, okay. now. Okay, okay. Um, there's, there's the last question in, in the Q&A box. Let me see, yeah, it's it, my book, how does it, end, how does it individuals can work with their own students? Oh, yes. So yes, the, the last, I'll just answer this real quick. Yes, this work is it, hard when, it, when you don't have the leadership behind you. Um, we did show examples of schools where the leadership wasn't totally, you know, it, you know, about this project and that teachers with authentic work with their students um, helped the leadership move 
um, in that regard, right? And so I think there are, there's at least one or two examples of where, you know, some of this work would had to be done a little bit more subversively or, you know, or sort of in pockets that then created um, change in the larger school community. And so I would, for those of us who feel like we have to do this work alone, it's often, just like all this work we're seeing in, in, in society right now, we might be that lone person or three people in our town who's doing a Black Lives Matter, you know, rally, but like when other people see that and that see that that's an option, right, that, that has a powerful impact. And so even if you're, it's not ideal to be doing it in that pocket or doing it alone, but when you do it and then look and it's successful, other teachers will definitely jump on board. Okay, thank you. And that, uh, that concludes the Q&A portion. And uh, I'll now hand it back over to Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Graves, for your insight and your expertise. We are honored to have you here with us today. It was magnificent as usual, so thank you so much. Um, and I do want to recognize some of the questions that were being asked. In underpinning our future work um, at the SDE, it is critically important for us to continue um, having dialogue and having a platform to continue this work on um, critical consciousness. And we have been doing this work um, actually for a while now, for over two years with Darren Graves. Um, and we are planning on continuing to obviously do this work with um, Dr. Darren Graves as well. And so stay tuned on that. Um, and I do want you to realize that um, the commissioner's, one of his uh, priorities is focusing on equity. Um, and that has also been one of our uh, goals for the last like three years. Um, so we will be continuing this work for sure. And I just want to thank you all for your great questions, your engagement, um, and thank you for being a part of this webinar. And we really do appreciate you and we want you to all say, um, stay safe and well. Thank you very much. <laughs>